in South Sudan. My parents were linguists. They were working on taking a language that had only an oral tradition and making it into a written tradition. This is something that takes 10 to 15 years, takes a long time. One of the fascinating parts about growing up there was that the, the money that was used was actually cattle, okay? So the Tupos had been using this for many years, and each of these white beads represents a, head, uh, a herd of cattle, so roughly 20. So this is 120 uh, cattle that are accounted for on this one string of beads, and you can see people wearing four to six of these at one time. If you needed something smaller than that, you use goats. If you need something smaller than that, you break it down to beads. And then my sister and I, you see there pumping our water. My parents built this metal house that we lived in. Was, uh, you know, we didn't have electricity. We didn't have power. We had uh, paraffin lamps and candles, uh, and we made do with that, and we were fine. But one of the things I think that's very important for all of us to understand is that we have a lot of electricity. We're used to our Wi-Fi working. When we go to the hospital, we expect it to be open at night. Our, our water runs out of our faucets, right? And we're, we're a little bit distanced from what energy actually does today. Uh, we're, we see it as something that's valuable, but we don't actually understand how valuable it is. So the world's most foundational commodity is energy. Everything depends on energy in one form or another as a production input. By virtue of the proof of work model, Bitcoiners understand this. Bitcoin cannot be created or transacted without the expenditure of very large amounts of energy. So I did a quick calculation based on a 24 joules a terahash Bitcoin mining machine. It takes 914 kilowatt hours to make one Bitcoin. Let's make that real. What does it mean to you or I? Well, that same amount of energy would power, would power different amounts of energy in different places and different homes, right? So in the US, it's very different than it is in Africa, than it is in Asia. The story of human progress is the story of energy. Energy is the base layer for all of this progress. It doesn't matter if it's healthcare or grades, education. It doesn't matter if it's security. It doesn't matter if it's productivity. Everything is built on this one main source. So there's this fantastic little video put together, a documentary put together by the BBC um, called The Human Power Station. I'm just gonna show the beginning of it for you to understand what it looks like. Hello, welcome to a very special edition of Bang Goes the Theory. Now, we've put up this house outside our studio, and inside, a family of four are fast asleep, and they're here to take part in a massive experiment. The only thing is, they've absolutely no idea what that experiment is. In fact, we've genuinely no idea whether or not it's going to work. Liz, are we up and running in there? We are indeed, Dallas. We are about to do something that no one in the world has ever tried to do before. We're going to unplug that house from the main supply and try to power it in a completely different way. Welcome to the human power station. Twelve grueling hours. Eighty human dynamos. But just one question. Can we really pull this off? Oh my God, guys! So you can still find this on YouTube, and I, I, I really suggest you watch it because it's, it's really funny. Uh, one of the interesting parts is that it took 24 cyclists to heat the oven and 11 to provide the energy just to make two slices of toast. So why does this matter, right? It matters because of this slide that we've seen many times before, right? Which is, there's no such thing as a low energy rich country. If you do not have electricity, m much of electricity for your population, you will always be behind those that do. And to give you real numbers on this, the US up in the upper right uses 5.5 times more energy than the whole African continent combined. So when we look at the continent of Africa, we see a major problem, right? Of the 800 million people in the world who don't have any electricity, 600 million of them are in Africa. And in the most recent IEA report that was done this year, in the past 20 years, we've seen major increases in electric electrification across Asia and Latin America, but Africa has maintained 600 million. We haven't improved at all. 
Why is that? Because the model's broken. If we want to actually light our world, we have to think about this model completely differently. Every African, the average, uses about 6.1 kilowatt hours uh, per month across the continent, right? That's not a lot of energy. So if you're trying to build a successful energy company and you're only, your customers only use six kilowatt hours, it's really hard to make returns on that investment. So let's look at it even closer. It doesn't matter if you're in a, a Malawian village or you're in the United Kingdom. The pockets of wasted energy here are large. You can find it everywhere. So everywhere above the line is not being used. That's stranded power. So at Gridless, our job is to monetize the stranded power. We do that by pushing electrification further to the edges in Africa, looking for these off-grid energy sites that aren't utilizing everything that they have. We also do this purpose. The, pur the other reason we do this is because by doing by pushing the hash rate of these miners to these little areas, we're also decentralizing the Bitcoin network. What does it actually look like for ordinary people? This. So if I'm building an energy site, I've built this energy site on this, on this far left side. I'm only making a small amount of returns. When Gridless comes along, we fully monetize the stranded power and we share that revenue in Bitcoin with the energy partner and they are finally able to be a sustainable company. So I wanted to take a real world example. So this is a 700 kilowatt site in Zambia. It was built more than 15 years ago. It was grant funded at first. Fantastically well built, really well built. Local community was a part of it. In fact, they did it all by hand. There was no, there was no machinery used to build this site. It was, it was it's something that we actually haven't seen much across Africa, that's how well it built it was. But over the last 15 years, They've never used more than 35% of the energy that flows from the river through that turbine. So Dan, the owner of it, we started talking about it with him because he'd heard about what we'd done in Kenya. And he said, well, could you come here? So what, what do we do, really? We take containerized Bitcoin mining and we put it wherever it needs to be, right? So it's this geographically agnostic buyer of last resort, real-time demand response system for energy. And if you have wasted power, you have to think about what my friend Alex said, which is, at night the people sleep, but the river never sleeps. There's energy to be monetized here, and that matters. So what does it look like when you're making one of these Bitcoin mines? Well, we start off with a uh, Bitcoin mining container designed here and engineered here and built here in Nairobi because we realized it was about a quarter of the cost of importing one. We then put that on the back of a truck. It could go 2,000 kilometers down to Zambia like this one is. We unload it, and then we start doing our connectivity, right? So Starlink, we've, we also connect to the mobile network operator, so we have a couple different forms of connectivity so we don't drop any shares. Then we load what my business partner, Philip, calls the world's dumbest computer into these uh, mining containers. They only do one thing. Right? They don't do anything else, they only mine Bitcoin. Once they're, once they're loaded in there, we turn them on. This, takes, this whole process takes about three days. Yes, and I'm, just, I'm KYM while I'm there, Kazuyam Kono. All I do is plug in things and carry heavy loads. By day three, you have a fully functioning Bitcoin mining container set up in this new site. And that really means something to the owner of this energy. Because that next morning, he picks up his phone, he makes Bitcoin. He sees it in his wallet and he goes, we're having breakfast. There's nowhere to stay here, by the way. We're, we're camping on the side of the river. He looks at it and he's like, I just made money. It's like, yeah, you get that every day. Every day, right? You're not waiting for somebody to make payments to you. It's coming. And, he's, and he looks up and he says, I can finally start thinking strategically about my business. I've never had enough money to even have my power line workers paid on time, and now I can. This is the power of Bitcoin mining in energy. So I was curious, right? I, I wasn't from the energy sector, I'm from the tech world, and um, Bitcoin mining makes sense to me because we built hardware and infrastructure before. 
But I didn't know anything about energy when we started. So I, st I read about 17 research papers on uh, airplane flights, which is the best place to do it. Um, and I wrote my own paper to make sense of it, which I called Energy and Bitcoin in Africa, right? And, and the basics of it is this, so you don't have to read it. It's, 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 it's not important that you read it. What's important is that you understand the problem. The national power grids have gone about as far as they will go. The reason why is because the people who need energy now live in far-flung places and they don't have the population density to get a return on investment of ma major power grids. So the answer for this is through mini-grids, small energy sites that can be put wherever they're needed. They look like this. They're simple, right? And I broke this down as simple as we can to so see just run of river hydro. We also operate uh, biomass and geothermal, but run of river hydro really is the right answer for Africa. The water comes into a four bay, it goes into a powerhouse, turbine, powers the Bitcoin mining data center, the houses, and the, and the businesses. That Zambian site had about 1,000 families, households on it when we first came there, and just over 200 businesses. So that's maize mills, healthcare, uh, education, government offices, mobile phone towers, all those types of things. By the time, this time, I was there a month ago, it was over, it was over 1,500 households now, and they needed more of the energy. So what does that mean for us as Bitcoin miners? We turn off miners, that's the answer, right? So we actually turn off miners and move them somewhere else. And, and this is something that you can also do with Bitcoin mining that you can't do with other industrial off-takers. You can be really, really flexible. So the World Bank states that Africa needs 140,000 mini-grids to meet the demands of the 600 million Africans who don't have power. The African Mini Goods Association claims that there's only 5,000 that have been built. We have a problem. So up until this point, Gridless has been, has been dealing with the symptom, which is how do we make off-grid energy profitable, right? But the disease is that we need more energy built. Well, how do we get more energy built? Well, we need different types of financing because as you saw from that first chart, for 20 years, actually about 60 years, we have had the same model for energy financing and we haven't hardly put a dent in the numbers. It turns out that the same financial technology that enables us to address the symptoms is the tool that also eradicates the disease, which is Bitcoin. In this case, we take Bitcoin and we make it into a financial reactor. We borrow against, the, we borrow, we create a treasury that we borrow against with the USD and we can now build tangible assets. So Gridless Energy creates a financial reactor that produces both more energy and more Bitcoin over time, which in turn creates more energy again. So if I was to break it down, it'd be looking like this. We take fee investment, create a Bitcoin treasury, lock it up with our lender, build energy with it, make more Bitcoin, and put that back into the, into the top again. It's a pretty simple model. And we often wonder why nobody else has done this yet. So Bitcoin financing unlocks this endless energy. And it does it in a couple of ways. We use Bitcoin to finance new energy development. We use Bitcoin mining to make energy profitable already. And we use Bitcoin as the market maker for the energy price. And this last one t deserves a little bit more explanation. How much do Bitcoin miners get paid? If you, if you were to take are a usage of kilowatt hours and breaking it down into dollar cents, we get paid between seven and 10 cents per kilowatt hour that we use, okay? So anybody who's willing to spend two cents more, relatively, you know, just 11 cents more, right? Or sorry, one or two cents more, so 11 cents or 12 cents, they would be paying us more money. So we should turn off miners and allow them to get it. Well, you say, well, 11 to 12 cents per kilowatt hour is that expensive, is that not expensive? Well, we know in rural Africa on off-grid energy, people are paying between 30 to over a dollar per kilowatt hour already today. So if they could get this wholesale energy at 12 cents, that's actually cheaper than any of us here in Nairobi pay, right? So they could actually get cheaper energy than the rest of anybody else on the continent this way. There's a new model that actually breaks the current paradigm. So Gridless Energy is, is, is going to be doing this. For the last year, we've been doing feasibility studies on our first three sites in Malawi and Kenya. 
And the idea is that we will be on the front edge of this as well as the back edge. We can make it profitable for everybody along the way. So one way that I like to say this to make it even more um, clear is that ten, in, in today's model, $20 million would build you 10 megawatts of power. And in 30 years, you'll still have 10 megawatts of power unless you go raise more money. In the gridless model, where we build a treasury, $20 million converted to Bitcoin builds one to four gigawatts over that same 30 years. Key benefits, real Bitcoin returns. Thank you. But I don't care about the Bitcoin returns as much as I care about the model being seven times more capital efficient in 10 years and 148 times more capital efficient in 30. And these are 50 year assets, just so you understand. So, why is this important? That economics are just unequaled, right? Sure, but for Bitcoin it matters because it decentralizes the Bitcoin mining, right? We're moving into small scale mining happening all over the place. Now this is already happening, but we need to have see more of it. And instead of having these, these large 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt Bitcoin mining farms, we can have one to three big megawatt Bitcoin mining farms spread across 100 countries. What it does for energy is we can finally make it profitable, sure, but we can also make it, we can make it a new future for Africans where we can have more reliable power in the places where people live. And for Africa, it just means that we can finally put a dent in that $600 million, $600 million figure. So there is a near unlimited supply of energy to be developed in the one place on earth that needs it most in Africa. And Bitcoin is what, is what unlocks it. Thank you.